I'm here with uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, a creator of the New York Times Magazine's landmark 1619 project. Uh, her work chronicles the history of slavery in America and examines the many aspects of contemporary life in the United States, from the racial wealth gap to housing discrimination, uh, and how they're all connected to the legacy of America's original sin. Uh, her latest article for the New York Times, What is Owed? It is Time for Reparations. It makes the case that America must pay its debts to the descendants of enslaved people. Uh, Nicole, I am so delighted to have you uh, with us today. I hope you are, I hope you can please come in <laughs> wherever you are. You're in, <laughs> you're in New York City, Bedford-Stuyvesant. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much. I, I really, I, your, your writing blows me away. I, I thought that uh, your cover story for the New York Times Magazine last week was fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. I recommend everybody read it. Uh, and also your other work uh, has been uh, just illuminating. That's all I can say. So I just, uh, what I want you to do, uh, and this is unusual because usually there's a lot of Q&A and I just want you to talk. I want you to tell us uh, <laughs> just about uh, your most, let, maybe let's start with your most recent article on what is owed, it's time for reparations. Uh, and uh, yeah, take us through that argument, please. Sure, thank you so much for having me on. Um, as I told you, when you reached out to me on Twitter, I've been an admirer of, of your work and your voice. Uh, it really has a moral force that I think we need in this country. So um, just really honored to be on. So the, the piece that I wrote for the Sunday Magazine uh, is called What is Owed? And um, I had been thinking about and, and researching for a reparations piece that was going to be part of the 1619 project, but I wasn't ready to write it yet. Uh, however, as George Floyd's uh, death occurred and these protests started breaking out all over the country and I saw what felt really different this time, um, how sustained the protests have been, that the protests were occurring in all 50 states, that uh, the protesters were multiracial and multigenerational. And even in places that have a very tawdry racial history like Vidor, Texas, uh, they were doing Black Lives Matter protests. At the same time, we're in the middle of a pandemic and we know the entire country is suffering economically but that black Americans, because of the history of this country, suffer so much worse. So all I kept thinking was, if this moment is really different, if if this is if, if we're kind of at the precipice of transformational change, we can't just be asking that police don't kill citizens in the street without uh, consequence. We have to be asking for something much bigger, which is to finally address um, the really um, glaring and crippling economic poverty that Black Americans live in. And, and, and I'm talking about a poverty of wealth, regardless of the income that Black people have. So that's why I decided to write this piece to really say we need to be thinking much, much bigger than police reforms. Police reforms are important. But what makes Black life so hard is actually that Black people own uh, 10 cent of wealth for every one dollar of wealth that white Americans have. And that that's really what makes your life hard in this country. Um, and so this is the time to at least consider fixing it. Well, that 10 to one ratio you just mentioned hasn't changed uh, in years. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's not, I mean, we a, a lot of white people like to think that uh, black people are getting ahead there's a kind of, and you refer to it in your work, a kind of uh, 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 a mythology uh, that in fact things are getting better when they're not getting better and they haven't got better for many, many years. Uh, how, do you, how do we overcome that mythology? How do we overcome that almost uh, avoidance mechanism uh, that a lot of white people carry around uh, thinking that black people are doing better and better. Yeah, so I think it's caused by a couple of things. Um, so first, let me just start with the data. What the data show are that 
Black Americans, the income gap between white Americans and Black Americans is unchanged over the last 70 years. So this is before Dr. King's March on Washington. Uh, we have not seen any progress on closing the income gap, but much more important than income is wealth. And the wealth gap also is unchanged for the last 70 years. So before the civil rights movement, uh, the wealth gap is the same. The difference, of course, between income and wealth is income is your paycheck. That's what most of us use to pay our bills. But wealth are your assets minus your debt. And wealth is what allows you to weather financial storms. If you lose a job, you can still pay your mortgage every month. It's what allows you to put a down payment on a house or send your kids to school. And we've seen a significant number of Black Americans move into uh, positions with higher incomes. So I think a lot of the reason that so many white Americans kind of have this uh, denial about the depth of uh, wealth poverty is they have black coworkers and they assume those black coworkers are making the same amount of money that they have. And that is uh, progress. But the difference is their black coworkers have almost no wealth. So even though they have the same salaries, they don't have the same amount of wealth, which means they are not able to actually um, have financial security or make the type of investments in home ownership and college that uh, white Americans with the same income are making. So that's part of it. The other part of it, though, is um, we have long had a society where white Americans really just want to be done with the past. Uh, once we had the bloody civil rights movement and uh, ended discrimination in the law, white Americans kind of want to believe, well, that was it. That was our only obligation. Everyone's equal now. And we don't have to actually do anything to make up for 350 years of, of legal discrimination. Um, but the systems of slavery and of Jim Crow were systems of economic exploitation, uh, first and foremost. They were designed to extract wealth from black labor and to keep black people from keeping that wealth for themselves. So we have not dealt with a centuries long plundering of black wealth that leaves black people in the position that we are today. White people don't wanna feel guilty. And um, I think I try to make very clear in my essay that this is not about feeling guilty for something that you didn't do, but understanding that we all inherit this legacy and this legacy um, has a lasting effect on Black Americans. And we do have an obligation to address it without having to take on uh, individual and personal guilt. And that history is critical. I mean, in your writing, uh, and one thing that I find so impressive is your weaving of history into the present. Uh, and that weaving of history into the present is critically important for understanding why even though your co-worker, your black co-worker, if you're white, uh, can have the same income as you may be, uh, still doesn't have the wealth you do uh, because wealth is tied to history. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. I mean, in terms of your research yeah. and your writing, how does current wealth depend upon not only your own history, but your parents and grandparents and maybe even your great grandparents history. Absolutely. So history is is a really linchpin of my work because I, I don't think that as Americans, we can understand our society and particularly uh, racial disparities and um, the racial experience if we don't understand the history of how we got here, that all of this is created. Uh, so in this piece, I really uh, worked hard to answer all of those questions that I hear from white Americans about why this is necessary and why there is such a gap. And so much of it is because of our long history of specifically uh, first allowing chattel slavery against black Americans and then legalized discrimination against black Americans. So when we think about wealth, wealth uh, tends to be accumulated over time. It tends to be handed down from generation to generation and then built upon with each generation. Very few Americans have earned all of their wealth on their own. They might get you know, a $5,000 inheritance or a family member passes down a house or some property or you know, their parents help uh, pay for their college. So that wealth is uh, accumulate, accumulated. But Black Americans have never had a real opportunity to accumulate that wealth. So when we understand that under uh, slavery, 
250 years. And we should just make clear that uh, we had slavery in this country longer than we have not had slavery, which is just a fact. We um, Slavery ended 155 years ago, but it was practiced for 250 years. So that's 250 years of Black people not being able to accumulate any wealth, any property. It was illegal. Legal black people uh, who were enslaved to own property, anything that they owned actually belonged to the uh, enslaver. It was illegal for black people to make wills and to have heirs. Uh, so when black people gain their freedom at emancipation, they are, as historian Carrie Lee Merritt says, the only group of people in the history of our country who, as a race, started off with zero capital. Uh, we come into freedom without owning anything, without banks, without money, without clothes, without um, food without property. And that means that we were already very far behind. Um, and of course, it is immediately after slavery that black people first start pressing for reparations. They're saying, we need some land. We need um, something to help us be able to become financially independent to support ourselves. Um, the federal government very briefly uh, experimented with reparations, uh, the 40 acres, we all have heard of 40 acres and a mule. It was actually just 40 acres. There was never a mule. And small numbers of black formerly enslaved people were able to get that 40 acres uh, of former Confederate land and start working on it. But then Abraham Lincoln was assassinated and uh, immediately the 40 acres was repealed and that land was returned to the Confederates. So the federal government decides enslaved people were not worthy of um, receiving any type of land or reparations. But at that same time, it passes the Homestead Act. And the Homestead Act gives away hundreds of millions of acres of land to white Americans and also uh, was used to entice white immigrants to come to the United States. Fully 10% of all the land in America was given out under the Homestead Act. And today, I think about 46 million white Americans can trace uh, their legacy directly to this free land that the government was giving white people while denying any type of land to the formerly enslaved. Um, you follow that period up then with 100 years of racial apartheid where discrimination against the descendants of the enslaved was legal in every aspect of law was also a period of great racial terrorism to try to keep black people in exploitable labor force. We, many of us have heard about Tulsa in, um, this year where one of the wealthiest black business districts in the country was, was burned down, but that happened all over the country. Black businesses were destroyed, black land was destroyed. Uh, black people were not allowed to work certain jobs that would give us uh, a financial foothold. So what that meant is that by the time you got to my parents' generation, you had white Americans who, because of programs like uh, the New Deal, were able to really build um, themselves into a middle class with a, a decent amount of wealth and stability. And black Americans had been generationally deprived of that same thing. Uh, so we're living with that legacy right now. I can tell you um, nearly every black person I know who has the same education I have, who has the same type of job I have, uh, does not have wealth. And so they are not able to buy into the same neighborhoods as their white colleagues or uh, have the same uh, cushion. That's how we got here. But most of us never learned that history. And because we don't learn that history, I think that's why when you poll Americans on reparations, uh, something like 70% or higher of Americans say that they are opposed to them because we really don't understand that lasting impact and legacy uh, and the singularity of the Black experience that other groups face discrimination, but no group uh, has ex faced the, the continuous dragnet of exploitation and discrimination that Black Americans have. And that continuous dragnet of exploitation and discrimination, Nicole, uh, really does work itself right up beyond the Civil Rights Act and the Voting yeah. Rights Act. I mean, what you point out is that redlining in various subtle forms in terms of bank lending or not lending to black people, uh, all sorts of wealth uh, transfers that are not actually permitted or have been uh, dip made much more difficult for black people, uh, and even college uh, and access to college. So uh, you, you, uh, in other words, this history doesn't stop. It's not That's as right. if you have uh, slavery and then you have a brief 12 years of reconstruction uh, and then you've got basically a reaction 
uh, that does not end at any particular time. It's living right up to the present day. Uh, is that a fair interpretation of what you've been writing about? Absolutely. So as you know, in the piece, What is Old, I, I try to make that very clear that when we pass these civil rights laws in the 1960s, we're not going back and correcting the harm that was done. Uh, we're not necessarily integrating schools. We're not making up for the theft of Black people's education all those decades. Uh, we're not um, uh, making new housing values to make up for the fact that Black communities were redlined and so had their housing values artificially inflated while white communities had their housing values artificially inflated. We didn't equalize those values uh, when the Fair Housing Act was passed. Uh, we passed uh, laws against employment discrimination, but we didn't make up for you know all of the promotions Black people could not get because of their race, all of the jobs Black people couldn't work because of their race. And we don't really enforce uh, aggressively most of those fair housing uh, and civil rights laws now. So even though we had a um, 250 year legacy of legal discrimination, uh, excuse me, a 350 year legacy of legal discrimination for the last 50 years where we have gotten rid of discrimination in the law, we still have pervasive discrimination against black Americans. We know that black Americans face millions of incidents of housing discrimination every year. Under the Obama administration, we saw record settlements with banks for continuing to charge uh, black people with the same credit worthiness of white people, a much higher interest rate. Uh, we know that um, Black children are still the most segregated group of school children in the country. We know that Black people face pervasive uh, discrimination in employment. So all of the things that we're told that Black people need to do in order to um, make up for their wealth gap don't really work out for Black folks. Uh, when Black people buy a home, if it's in a Black neighborhood, those homes are valued less. Uh, we know that a Black person with a college degree is just as likely to be unemployed as a white person with a high school degree and actually has less, less wealth than a white person with a high school degree. So not only do we have a legacy of discrimination and disadvantage, but Black Americans still face ongoing discrimination and disadvantage. Now, when we looked at um, unemployment right now, more than half of all working uh, Black adults are unemployed uh, because of COVID-19. But even in the best of times, as you well know, Black Americans have doubled the unemployment rate of white Americans, no matter how good the economy is, and no matter and, what their educational levels. And even now in the pandemic, when you have Black people working, a disproportionate number of them are so-called essential workers who are taking, in many respects, their lives into their own hands and being subjected to great risk of this disease. Uh, but so here we are, all right? We, we, we're now up to the present time. Uh, we have demonstrations around the world. It's not just around the United States, yes. around the world. Uh, and we also have this issue of police violence. Uh, you wrote something uh, that I that struck me uh, obviously very powerfully. You said that at least 6,500 black people were lynched from the end of the Civil War to 1950, which is an average of two a week for 90 years. And then fast forward, nearly five black people have been killed a week by the police since 2015. Uh, now, you don't actually make the direct connection, but it's easy to see a connection there in terms of uh, what was not quite state-sanctioned or state-sanctioned lynching and the kind of state-sanctioned executions that we've been seeing in recent years. Uh, but at least we are now seeing protests. Uh, but will the protests, in your view, uh, translate into fundamental change? Nicole, I'm, I, this is something that you have spent a great deal of time uh, thinking about and writing about. Are we at an inflection point finally, looking back on this extraordinarily long, shameful, bitter, violent history, can we say, can anybody say, well, the chances are much better now than they've ever been before? So I think that that's largely going to depend on uh, how willing 
people are to remain in the streets and how willing those of us, particularly in the media who have platforms, are to keep paying attention and shining a spotlight. Because as we know, uh, the attention on racial justice in this country is very fickle. The media's attention on racial injustice in this country is very fickle. Um, I'm not going to try to predict the future, but if you study history, as I say in my piece, it doesn't bode well for transformative change. However, um, none of us would have expected that we would see this type of sustained protest. Um, we've had, as I said, there's been five deaths, an average of five deaths of black people by police um, every week for the last five years. And yet we haven't seen this type of, of sustained protest. So what I'm worried about though, is we already see what's happening in Congress. Uh, doesn't seem like the Republicans are willing to really put forth or support a bill that is going to have a real effect on police violence. Um, the, the media is not covering these protests like they used to, um, and that concerns me. At the same time, in New York City, uh, the protests here have been relentless. Uh, we have had uh, more than a month straight of uh, protests and they are camped out in front of the uh, governor or excuse me, the mayor's mansion and really demanding change. Um, and we saw that there are gonna be significant cuts in the policing budget uh, from the mayor's office and, and from the city council because of that. So if we are, if this moment is going to be truly transformative, it's going to largely depend on how willing white Americans are to make it so. Uh, black people are 13% minority in this country, and we have to have a significant number of, of white Americans who are uh, going to be unrelenting in their support and agitation, and in the media, who are not just going to simply move on to the next story. Um, because as you know, uh, politicians respond to pressure and they respond to what they think significant numbers of their constituents are demanding. And without that pressure, I, I think we're gonna have um, a story that 10 years from now will be written about like so many other periods in our history where there were uh, these sparks, but they never ended up uh, transforming the system. Uh, well, something that gives me a little bit of hope, and I share your worry and your skepticism given the history, uh, but something that gives me a little bit of hope is that one big difference with these protests and these demonstrations is that they are biracial. Uh, there are a lot of white people involved. There are a lot of white people on the street. Young people, and I teach a lot of young people, uh, have a very different attitude in general uh, toward race and toward racism than I remember the young people I taught 40 years ago, or I remember the people who I was young with. Uh, 50 and 60 years ago. Uh, so maybe there is a chance for change. The other thing I want to throw in the hopper, uh, Nicole, is Donald Trump uh, and mm -hmm. the Republicans and the Republican Party that has become basically a cult of Trump. And Trump's use of racism uh, is, it looks like, and I hope I'm, uh, I'm, I'm accurate, it looks like it is failing. It's look, look, it looks like it's boomeranging on him. And that might also be a positive thing. What do you think? Yeah, I definitely have felt heartened. I mean, part of what makes this moment feel so different is, and I would say uh, the protests aren't biracial, they're multiracial. Uh, you're seeing Asian Americans, Latino Americans, white Americans and black Americans all taking to the streets to say that black lives matter. Um, and, and that is really what makes this moment different. And also what makes it different is we are in the middle of a pandemic that not only is devastating, um, uh, disproportionately devastating black people in terms of health, but all, you know, millions of Americans are feeling uh, the financial rug has been snatched from underneath them. And I think it has given an empathy that you can uh, be struggling to pay your bills, struggling to make your mortgage, and it doesn't have anything to do with your own personal responsibility. And, and I think that has allowed uh, many white Americans to feel an empathy with uh, black Americans uh, and the financial struggles of black Americans that they perhaps didn't have before. Um, and, and so I think when you have that combination of so many Americans living on the financial edge and so many Americans understanding that actually there's certain things we need our government to do for us as Americans. Uh, and then uh, watching uh, 
a black man literally lynched on national TV has, has set um, a fire in people that we couldn't have predicted. And absolutely, uh, who was in the White House is a big part of that. Uh, folks were willing to accept this argument of, of uh, economic anxiety, um, but at this point, it's a death pact. It's a death pact for white supremacy. We see someone who, as he uh, gets more and more concerned about his own reelection, um, speaking more and more the very explicit language of racial animus and racism. And I think large numbers of Americans want to reject that and um, work towards an America uh, that would not elect a man like that into the White House. Well, in terms of working toward an America in the future, we have just a few minutes left. I want to go back to your article, uh, that cover story in the New York Times Magazine, uh, What is Owed? It's Time for Reparations. Uh, you make the case that uh, reparations really are, there are kind of three areas that you pointed out. Uh, number one was genuine enforcement of civil rights laws and, and voting rights laws. Uh, the second was investments real investments in uh, communities of color uh, that are primarily still black communities, schools, healthcare, housing, and so forth. But then you also say, number three, individual cash payments to descendants of the enslaved. And I'd like you to just spend a couple of minutes helping us understand what that might mean and what you intended for it to mean. Sure. So the only way to close a wealth gap is by transferring wealth. We know that all of the other things we say that can close the wealth gap, the data and the research show that they simply won't work. Uh, black people going to college doesn't close the wealth gap. Black people getting married doesn't close the wealth gap. Black people purchasing homes won't close the wealth gap. So the only thing that can close the wealth gap is to provide restitution for the people who were never allowed to accumulate wealth. Now, I think we have to do all those other things. We have to invest in segregated communities. We have to enforce civil rights law or that wealth transfer is, is probably not going to have the lasting impact that it needs to. But, um, I think we really need to consider like we we understand in American law, the idea of financial restitution when someone harms you. Uh, people sue all of the time for uh, negligence, for being harmed by different entities. And that's what um, is required here as well. I think what's much more important, um, two things I'd like to say is that this is a societal debt. Just like we inherit uh, the glory of our country, we also inherit its wrongs. If you uh, want the uh, protections of the Constitution, even though you weren't alive back then, and even though you didn't sign the Constitution, um, if you want those now, you also have to deal with the fact that we were a country built on slavery and um, we need to make right what was done. Um, the other thing is, it's not good for our country to have this type of inequality. It's not good for our country to have a 13% permanent uh, underclass who cannot um, you know, take advantage of the bounty of this country. So a reparations program would put money into the economy. Black Americans would do the same thing that white Americans do. They would use that money to start businesses, to send their children to college, to buy homes. This would be a, a, a dramatic infusion into our whole country. And the last thing, I know I said that was the last thing, but the last thing I'll say is, uh, I also support universal anti-poverty programs for all Americans. So I understand, you know, there are, there are people who are not black who say, well, I struggle financially too. I believe that we in this country have the wealth to do all of those things. We can have a livable wage. We can have universal health care. We can have a social safety net. Um, we can even have a universal basic income. And I'm supportive of all of those programs, but uh, reparations is about dealing with the singular harms that Black Americans face and the singular wealth poverty that Black Americans face. And I just hope that we can get to a point in this country where we understand that we do owe a debt and that that debt will actually benefit our whole society if we pay it. Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, I promised you a half hour. You've given us <laughs> a half hour very graciously. Uh, you pointed out, and I want to just close on this note, uh, that one of the most important aspects of whether this moment is going to be genuinely a turning point has to do with keeping people informed, keeping people active, 
making sure that the protests do lead to political change and overcoming one of the basic problems we have in this country, not just structural racism and systemic racism, but also a short attention span. Uh, yeah. And what you are doing in your writing and what we are trying to do on Inequality Media is to maintain and extend and enlarge that attention span. And so I want to just thank you for all you your work. I want to thank the New York Times for allowing you the space that it gives you. And I want to hope that you continue to do what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much.